much of my own work in, in my books about the Holocaust, I try to start with specific people, specific names, what we know about their lives, because the reason why their death is important is that they were, they were alive and that they only has meaning if we can, if we can remember the particularities of, of, of their lives. So that's, that's very important. That kind of remembering is very important. And also without the memories of those people, we can't understand the Holocaust. Like the, the Jewish memories, the Jewish sources, not just the survivors, but also Jews who died in the Holocaust, who left behind something. Those sources are very important to arguments that we make, including the arguments I make about how important the state and the destruction of the state is, because Jews see things that other people don't see. But that's all part of history, right? Seeing memory that way is all part of history. And history involves explanation. The reason why history and explanation are so important is that they let us look out into the future. They let us recognize patterns that we might not otherwise see. If we just commemorate, if we just agree that a terrible thing happened, then we lose the important question of why. The things that we're, we don't find intuitive, like it has a lot to do with the economy or law, or the things that we might want to reject, like it has a lot to do with fear of some kind of future ecological crisis. The things that we don't find comfortable or intuitive, they get left by the wayside. And of course, it's good to agree that racism and anti-Semitism are unacceptable, but that's only part of what we have to understand from the Holocaust. Racism and anti-Semitism were present in the world in 1935 and also in 1955, but there are reasons why the Holocaust happened when and where it did. And we need those reasons because those reasons, those causes, are, the, are also the things that we have to look out for. We also have to look out for fear of ecological crisis. We have to look out for people who think there's an ecological crisis coming and the best way to prepare for it is to decide that I belong to a group and that another group is threatening the things that my group might have, a process which is already underway. We have to learn from the Holocaust that the state and citizenship in the state is very important, right? If we don't learn those things, then a similar process can approach us without us being aware of it. When we tend to think about the causes of the Holocaust, we're very comfortable thinking about ethnicity, who did what. We're less comfortable thinking about the state and the law. And this is unfortunate because the state and the law have everything to do with how the Holocaust happened. If we kind of zoom out and look at Europe as a whole, the single thing which best predicts whether a Jew is going to live or a Jew is going to die is precisely what happens to the state, the pre-war state of which that Jew had been a citizen. So this works itself out at about three different levels. One level, the most basic, is that a bad state is still better than no state at all. If you're a citizen of a state, even a state that oppresses you, it's, it takes a certain amount of effort for you to be killed. Whereas if the state can be completely removed, if you're no longer a citizen of anything, then you no longer have these basic protections. A second level of what this works out has to do with the laws, the particularity of the law. So it's, it's, a, it's a simple and banal thing, but so long as there's a civil code, then you have some rights, including property rights. Then the third level this works at is that you have to imagine what happens to a state when it's broken? It doesn't just completely disappear, its fragments are still lying around. The Holocaust begins very slowly in Germany. When we look back, we look at the Nuremberg Laws, which make Jews into second-class citizens, and we think this is the beginning of the Holocaust. And it is, but a lot of other things have to happen along the way. If you look at the, the years of Jews in interwar Germany, they're oppressed, but they're not oppressed to the point where people at the time, including Jews in Germany themselves, could reasonably anticipate what was going to happen. The breaking point is not actually in Germany itself. The breaking point is when Germany takes over Austria, because here a very special process begins, which we can only understand if we remember that Austria had also been a state. Austria was a state. Jews were citizens. Jews could vote. There were no Nuremberg laws. It was a very imperfect place. It was run by a right-wing dictatorship, but it was a place where there were no Nuremberg laws. Jews were not second-class citizens. Jews were doing okay economically, relatively speaking. 
Then, essentially from one day to the next, on March 11th, 1938, Austria ceases to exist. And this is hugely important for all Austrian citizens, of course, but it's most important for the Jews because the Jews have the most to lose when the state goes away. The citizenship that they had in Austria suddenly no longer exists. Now, we forget this. Like, we think, how anti-Semitic were the Germans? How anti-Semitic were the Austrians? Were the Austrians maybe worse than the Germans? Is that so important? But what people at the time understood, what the Austrian Nazis understood, is that the moment the Austrian state goes away, all kinds of things are immediately possible, including things that are not possible in Germany itself. So the Austrian Nazis, members of the Austrian SA, they know who the Jews are. They know what apartments the Jews own. Most of the property around the Ringstrasse in the first district of Vienna at the time is owned by Jewish citizens of Austria. There are lists of all these people, of their apartments, of their automobiles. The Austrian Nazis immediately go after these people, partly to take their property, but also partly to show politically that Austria, the existence of Austria had to do with the Jews. And now we're moving on to something else. If you know any scene of the Holocaust in Austria, it's the scenes of those days, March 12th, 13th, 14th, when Jews are out in downtown Vienna scrubbing the streets. And we look at that and we say, that's humiliation. And of course it is, but that's only part of the story. What the Jews are scrubbing from the streets is also important. A few days before that, there was supposed to have been a referendum on Austrian independence, on the question of whether Austria should stay independent. It was that very referendum which prompted Hitler to threaten the country and eventually send in the army. So the propaganda on the streets was in favor of Austrian independence. It just said Österreich, which is the word Austria. And so it's not just that Jews were scrubbing the streets. Jews were scrubbing that word off the streets. They were scrubbing the name of their own country off the streets. And the people who were standing next to them, wearing the Hakenkreuz armbands and carrying the whips, those people were associating themselves with the new order. The message was clear. Austria was dominated by these Jews. We are now humiliating these Jews. That order is over. Now something new is coming. When Germany invades Poland, Germany takes the position, specifically the position, that Poland no longer exists. There's no longer a civil code. Jews no longer have any rights, including property rights. And that, although we tend to skip over it, is the beginning of a process which is then very familiar. So how can Jews be sent to ghettos? They no longer have any rights. How can their property be taken away from them? They no longer have any property rights. So the story of ghettoization, which for many of us is the familiar beginning of the Holocaust, has a great deal to do with the end of the state and the end of basic rights. The Polish police in the 1930s were guardians of property rights. They weren't perfect any more than police in any other place are, but one of the main things they did was protect property rights. So if you were a Jew in a village or town in Poland and you took part in the market on the city square, the Polish police were there to protect you and your property rights. Maybe you bribed them, perhaps you did, but that was their basic function. If you zoom forward from 1939 to 1942, 1943, a lot of those same men are doing basically exactly the opposite thing. They're in the Polish countryside, hunting down Jews, working for the German police. The only way to understand that transformation is to remember that the Polish state was destroyed. There's no longer a Polish Ministry of, of Internal Affairs. These guys no longer have the same structure, hierarchy that they had before. Those of them who choose to remain at work are in a different hierarchy, one which is now headed by Heinrich Himmler. And so a Polish policeman changes because the state is destroyed and all the institutions change. So we can look at that Polish policeman hunting down that Jew in the countryside and say, this is terrible and it's horrible and it's a crime and a murder, and it is. But if we want to understand it, we have to understand what happened to the institutions. When we think of the SS, the first thing we think about the SS, we think, okay, these are like policemen, but worse, or like soldiers, but worse. They wear uniforms. They must have to do with the state. And to get to the point of understanding theft of property, theft of art, and also mass murder, we have to realize the SS were not a state organization. They were not the police, but a little different. They were not soldiers, but a little different. The SS were a non-governmental organization. They were a paramilitary. And their ideology from the very beginning didn't have to do with the state and the law, right? So, I mean, an, an army in principle is following a chain of command, which is authorized by a constitution. The police in principle, 
I realize there are important exceptions, but the police in principle are, are meant to enforce the law. The SS were never meant to enforce the law. The SS were built from a completely different ideological foundation, which doesn't have anything to do with the state, which in fact is hostile to the state. Their ideological foundation is that we represent the best of the superior race. And it's not just that we're above the law, it's that the law doesn't really exist. The law is a kind of fiction. The real order in the world is a racial order. And so the very first thing the SS do, literally the first thing after Hitler claims complete power in early 1933, is guard the concentration camps. The concentration camps are precisely a lawless zone, right? Even a jail or a prison in some way is supposed to be under the law. A prisoner of war camp is supposed to be under the law. The concentration camps were explicitly zones outside the law. Therefore, zones of experimentation, zones where things could happen that couldn't happen other places. When we get down to the question of why people collaborate or why people in some way take part in the murder of their Jewish neighbors, we can't really handle that question without talking about the material and legal reality. Again, it's very tempting to say these people did what they did because they were an ethnicity we don't like. But it turns out that the best predictor of how people behave is not at all their ethnicity. The best predictor of how people behave is the legal and material environment around them. One thing about theft, which might not be obvious, is the way that it draws the larger population into the project of the Holocaust. So very importantly, in Poland in 1939, 1940, everybody loses property rights, not just the Jews. Everybody loses property rights. And so then when the Jews are expropriated, when they're taken from their houses, taken from their apartments, of course their neighbors take them. Unfortunately, that's how people behave. But the fact that everybody was in a situation of insecurity made that behavior all the more likely. And once you take that apartment, once you take that house, once you take that horse, once you take that work of art, whatever it is, you are then bound into the process. That changes your moral judgment. So on a, on a tremendous scale, across Eastern Europe and all across Europe, the ability to make property float free, right? Not necessarily the looting of specific things that are of great value, but that general ability to make property float free draws millions of people in some way or another into this process that we then understand as, as, as the Holocaust. When we think about the Nazis, we don't usually think about ecology and agriculture and economics and scarcity. But that says something about us. If we're from the United States or we're from the West, if we've grown up in the post-Second World War era, we've grown up in the era of, of the greatest prosperity in the history of, of the world. Not for the whole world, but at least for that part of the Northern Hemisphere. And that means that it's hard for us to see that in Europe in the 1920s and 1930s, scarcity was an issue of everyday politics be it because of the memory of the blockades of the First World War in Germany, be it because of the Great Depression and tremendous poverty and unemployment, be it because Germany, even at the best of times, was not agriculturally self-sufficient. This is an entirely different world. And in this world, a vision like Hitler's, in which life is just a contest, or he would say a struggle for resources, and the most important resource was land, that vision might be very radical, but it is closer to everyday experienced reality than, than we tend to remember. So where Hitler begins is this notion that everything that really matters in life is a struggle. Right? Human beings belong to races, says Hitler. Races are just like species, says Hitler. And all species do, says Hitler, is struggle for habitat. Therefore, we should be struggling for habitat. That is natural. If we're not struggling for habitat, then it's because of the Jews. And this is actually where his anti-Semitism begins because his idea, which is, you know, which is awful, but in fact more coherent than people like to, like to believe, his idea is that every idea which keeps us from struggle, communism, capitalism, the rule of law, the state, Christian mercy, those are all Jewish ideas. Any idea, any value, which allows us to recognize another human being as opposed to seeing somebody as us or them, my race or another race. All those ideas, says Hitler, are Jewish, and those ideas have polluted, from Hitler's point of view, the German mind. And therefore, from Hitler's point of view, you're restoring nature if you remove the Jews from the planet. 
what the Jews have done is they've distorted the natural order. They've perverted the natural order. And if we can remove them from the planet, then you will have this struggle and the stronger will survive. And maybe the stronger will be the Germans, we don't know, but the Germans will have done a great service to humanity if they remove the Jews from the planet. So we don't see the ecological part of this. We don't realize that an element that gave this vision of the world a certain kind of plausibility for Hitler, for Nazis, and for others is the actually existing scarcity. And this is one of the reasons why this experience of the Holocaust is actually more politically relevant today than I think people recognize because we are headed ourselves into a period in which global scarcity of resources is already becoming a reality, a reality for a lot of the people already, but perhaps for powerful Western countries soon. If we don't get our minds and our politics around climate change, the future is going to hold a, a terrible contest for resources. And then the question will be, how would we react to that? And personally, I'm not very convinced that we would react better. One way for us to react better is to remember the Holocaust as it was, to remember that this ideology, which we have learned properly um, to despise, that this ideology was also connected to ecological and economic reality. When the Western Allies occupied Western Europe, they somewhat unwittingly performed a very important role, which was they helped states recover, not just from a devastating war, but from a larger process of the end of empire. What Germany is doing on the Eastern Front is trying to establish a kind of last ditch empire. It's trying to create settler colonialism in Europe itself. And that's the first major defeat of an empire, which will be followed by many others in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. What the Americans are doing not just with West Germany, but with but much of the continent, is they're helping to finance in various ways a transition from seeing the world as a world of empires into seeing the world as a group of nation states that can cooperate. That's the Marshall Plan. Um, and to some extent, that's also the American military presence in, in Western Europe, which drives down defense budgets and allows investments in the welfare state and other things. There is, of course, a particular lesson which has to do with, with, with West Germany, that one country carries out the Holocaust and other horrible crimes. And in its becoming a the democracy that we know today, um, that particular history plays a very special part. And that's a lesson, not just for the Germans, but I think for everyone. If you can't look straight at your own history, it's unlikely that you're gonna be able to build up your state as a democracy in the 21st century. But then there's another lesson. The other lesson is that all of us in the West have different kinds of imperial or colonial histories. And all of us face this basic problem of what do you do when empire is no longer morally, or just to be very hard-headed about it, practically possible. You have to build up a state. You have to have ideas that are consistent with building up a state. And states only really work, even if you're a big country like the United States of America, they only really work if they're in some kind of cooperative relationship with other states. And so there's a, very, there's a very large lesson here about how if you want to have basically decent institutions, you have to get over this process of having an empire and expanding and start to think about the institutions themselves. And you have to think about how your state can get along with other states. And I don't want to push this point too hard, but these are lessons which not all Americans have really come to terms with. My impression about the teaching of the Holocaust would be that there have been three stages. In the first stage, it just wasn't taught. I mean, for a very long time, the Holocaust wasn't taught. Very few historians or scholars wrote about it. There was plenty of evidence. There are plenty of archival sources. It's always been a myth that there haven't been sources. But really, for the longest time, it wasn't, it wasn't taught. It wasn't seen as an important part of the Second World War in the United States, and it wasn't taught. The second stage, which I would say begins in the, the 1980s, is the memorial stage the stage that we're familiar with and which I think is now slowly coming to an end. In this stage, smart historians like, like Shaul Friedlander pointed out that we can't just let the Germans write the history of the Holocaust. And we can't let them write it just on the basis of German state sources because so many things are left out. There has to be a Jewish perspective. And that's very true. And, and Professor Friedlander wrote a very enlightening and very important breakthrough history of the Holocaust on that basis. And of course, the survivors are extremely important in giving us part of the truth. But if we think that we only get the truth from the survivors, we're now at a certain risk because there are very few left. What I hope is that we're entering into the third stage, which is the historical stage, 
where we have the sources from the survivors, we've recorded the sources from the survivors, we can cherish them and we can keep them indefinitely, we can keep them forever, but we can use them alongside other kinds of sources, including very importantly, the sources from the countries where the Holocaust mainly took place, like Poland and the Soviet Union, which we've now had a few decades to work over. So it's very important for us as we work on the Holocaust, not to just think, memory and memory and memory and reduce and reduce and reduce to what's comfortable and familiar to us. It's very important to, to raise historians who learn these languages, go to these places. Sometimes you don't have to anymore because it's digitized, but learn the language, read these sources, and come up with new and convincing interpretations and, and explanations that become broader and broader and therefore more accessible and more and more plausible. What I worry about is that if we treat this as only as memory, it, it's, it's, it just becomes a matter of respect for something that we don't really understand anymore. Whereas if we treat it as history, as a project where you keep going back to the archives and keep making new arguments, then the whole project is understanding. The whole project demands of us that we, that we try to exercise ourselves and make ourselves broader and see how something like this was, po was possible. Not just acknowledge that it was, but see how it was possible. I think we're now entering, I hope we're entering this historical stage where the Holocaust remains absolutely central to political and ethical discussion, but where we try to explain it like we would other historical events, because that explanation is, is, is so important for, for preventing things like it from happening again.